All right, next up, we have Amaryllis Nucleics. And presenting for Amaryllis Nucleics are Brad Townsley and Mike Covington. Welcome to Disrupt. Hi, I'm Brad, co-founder and CEO of Amaryllis Nucleics. And at Amaryllis, our mission is to improve RNA sequencing to accelerate discoveries in life science and human health. So, why RNA? Well, you're all familiar with DNA sequencing. Um, and the impact that it's had. Whole industries have been created around this technology. But DNA sequencing uh, isn't enough. Take, for example, personalized cancer diagnostics. Just having the sequence of, of the uh, cancer genome doesn't tell you what, what those mutations mean. Mutations can be harmless or mutations can be harmful. Which is why I want to introduce you to RNA. RNA is the expression of the genome. RNA is how information encoded in the DNA is carried out by cells. And RNA is the richest source of biological information we can access. So you might rightly be wondering, if RNA is so important, why haven't you heard as much about it as DNA sequencing? And the reason for that is the tools are not as well developed, and the process for preparing these samples is extremely difficult and expensive. In order to sequence RNA, you ha it has to undergo a complex and costly series of chemical reformatting so that it can be sequenced by the sequencing hardware. And this is very expensive. As much as 80% of the cost of an RNA sequencing experiment is just in this reformatting step, which means often experiments have to be scaled back or not done at all. So this doesn't need to be the case. RNA sequencing can be as accessible as DNA sequencing. And that's what we've done. At Amaryllis, we've developed a method that, that reduces the cost and time for this process. So when we were scientists at UC Davis, we had to prepare thousands of samples for RNA sequencing. So just to do our own work, we had to find a better way. And that's what we've done. And we've taken that innovation and converted it into this user-friendly kit that anyone can use to convert their RNA samples into sequence-ready libraries. So when a customer orders from us, this is what they get. And each color corresponds to one step in the process. So before I show you how it works, because it happens at a microscopic level, I'll walk you through an animation of the process. So we'll start with an RNA molecule. And we prime it with a short synthetic piece of DNA called a primer. And then an enzyme makes a copy of this DNA called cDNA. Now, from here, this is where we're different. We take advantage of a phenomenon called terminal breathing. And what terminal breathing is, is when DNA, RNA, or cDNA in double-stranded form open and close at the ends. And this is just a function of thermal energy, even at low temperatures. So when the cDNA opens up, this is when our adapter can interact with the interior bases. And from here, we use a second enzyme to make this transient interaction permanent. And we call this process breath capture. And just doing this eliminates several of the uh, most costly and complicated steps from the process. So following breath capture, we'll do a PCR multiplication to get the sample ready for sequencing. And Mike's going to show you an, an, a demonstration of the process. Can we go to a demo? So what Mike's doing is he's taking a sample of uh, human kidney RNA uh, in the tubes on the left and preparing it for sequencing. So the entire process would take about four hours, and no one wants to sit here that long. So we're showing you just the part where our innovation comes in. So he's introduced the adapter to the cDNA that we've synthesized earlier. And now he's adding the enzyme mix that'll take that interaction and make it permanent. So this reaction will finish in 15 minutes at room temperature and then be amplified by PCR for sequencing. Uh, can we go back to slides? So we've done this in just four steps and in four hours, which normally would be a multi-day process. We do it with high accuracy and at much lower cost than our competitors. So we've already sequenced these samples that Mike was preparing, and we also prepared them with an industry-leading competitor's kits. And we have high correlation between the genes that we found to be ex differently expressed between kidney and muscle tissue. But 
using ours, we were actually able to find more genes that are differently expressed. And our technology is also more strand-specific than this competitor, at 99.9%. .9%. And we're much better able to capture the beginnings of RNA molecules, which are notoriously difficult to capture, but extremely important. And next-generation sequencing is already a large market at nearly $3 billion, and with double-digit growth for the last several years and for the foreseeable future. And RNA sequencing is a growing component of this market. Right now, we're selling kits, mostly to academic labs, And in the future, we're looking to license our technology to facilities that do massive amounts of sequencing, like uh, academic core labs and pharmaceutical companies, because we can save them huge amounts of money and time per sample. So we're always looking for customers and partners. So if you're doing RNA sequencing or would like to, please come talk to us. Thank you. All right, nice work. <laughs> All right, judges, who has a question? Here. Well, congratulations on uh, stumping the judges, at least, uh, <laughs> at least this end of the judging table. Um, it, you know, selling to uh, universities and labs seems like a, oh, that, that would be an arduous process. How receptive are they? So how much pain are they in, and how, how much pain do you guys take away, and what's the receptivity from these labs? I can give you an example. Um, so uh, we worked with a lot of people doing RNA sequencing, and uh, some of the methods are multi-day process and a huge number of steps, and it's very easy to make a mistake along the way. And you don't know you've made a mistake until the end when it doesn't work. You have to start over. And uh, a friend of ours went, she was processing several hundred samples, and she found out after you know, several days, and she'd used up a lot of her precious samples, that it didn't work. And she laid down on the filthy lab floor and cried. Um, so that's, that's the pain we want to take away. So DNA sequencing has really come down in price. It's almost become a commodity. Do you predict the same will happen in RNA sequencing in the future? Certainly. So um, I think that the, the technology is uh, dependent on formatting molecules to a specific form for the, the interface with the hardware. Um, and DNA is already closer to what that needs to be. RNA just takes more steps to process. Um, but I think that. Uh, things like ours uh, and, and some others that may be developed in the future, you're getting to a much simpler, more streamlined process for getting these molecules formatted to, to something that the, the machines can read. So I, then what does your company look like, let's say, in three years when it's become faster, cheaper, and there are more people doing it? Um, uh, well, in three years, our company hopefully will have a more diversified product portfolio. Okay. <laughs> I, I used to be a... Uh, I used to work in a biology lab where I had to do 14-hour processes to stain stem cells. So I'm always a big fan of something that can reduce the uh, number of hours or replace grad students altogether having to do these very, very difficult processes. Um, the challenge uh, that I always think about in terms, of, um, in terms of what you're building is where the markets are on this, right? So that's sort of the question I have is that grad, grad students in academic labs are always very interesting. You know, there's a lot of research done. You can make a nice sort of uh, amount of money selling to that. But in terms of the applications on CRISPR or on anything else where you know, RNA sequencing needs to be done on an industrial scale, like where do you see that market going and how do you see your solution sort of fitting into many of the companies sort of doing this that are not necessarily academic labs? Um, academic labs are good customers because they're key opinion leaders, but they aren't the largest uh, accessible share of the market. Um, pharmaceutical companies are doing a lot of RNA sequencing. Uh, core facilities, uh, do a lot of sequencing, RNA sequencing for, um, for customers. So individual academic labs are, are good targets, um, and they also give you a lot of very good feedback. But uh, ultimately, they're not going to be the biggest share of, of that market. So, so what do you need to do to sort of access these industrial size sequencing? Because a lot of them are relying on robots. A lot of them have sort of different CRISPR uh, you know, programs that they've been setting up to sort of uh, implement you know, the, a much more efficient sequencing regime. And we're working on getting our kits to be compatible with uh, the robots that a lot of these facilities are using, um, because that's uh, a relatively straightforward thing that we can do. Someone has a robot, and we say, we can work with that robot. All you have to do is buy this, and you know, we have the, the programming ready for it to go. Um, that, that's something that's really important to a lot of them. And, so, and I'm just one more very quick follow-up question. What, what efficiencies do you bring when they're using your product or technology versus using what they're using now? Um, in an ideal case, if you don't mess up, it should work all of the time as long as the input material is of the of sufficient quality and quantity. Um, so uh, given that, it should work 100% of the time. But given that human error is always a factor, 
there's a lot less margin for error with ours because it's only four steps and it only takes about four hours as opposed to a couple of days with a whole, whole lot of steps. Um, so given that, ours is less likely to fail. So our RNA is obviously exciting because it's tissue specific and you can look at tissue specific conditions. Talk a little bit about kind of what do you think is the first set of markets where that's actually going to be at pharma scale? Um, um, and then I would also love to understand what is your IP position? Like what, is, what if this is patentable? What do you own? Uh, so our IP on this is uh, that uh, it's a composition of matter patent on that interface between the, the breathing cDNA, the DNA RNA hybrid with the uh, partially single stranded, partially double stranded adapter. So that the interface of those um, is uh, the composition of matter that the IP covers. Um, and where we see this going um, in the future is uh, probably uh, in the not too distant future, every doctor's visit will have a blood test that does RNA sequencing because with uh, RNA sequencing, you can see what cells are doing, what they're responding to, uh, and detect illness even before uh, symptoms are evident to a person. Um, and use in, in cancer diagnostics, you can see um, what processes are being relied on by cancer cells, uh, and, and you can target more effectively what, what therapeutics to use. Um, whereas with DNA sequencing, you may get lucky and have a known mutation, but there will just be generally thousands of mutations. You have no idea what any of them do. Um, I'd like to follow up on that. Um, there was a paper that I like to talk about from November 2015. Uh, this Amsterdam uh, group, they did RNA sequencing on a drop of blood, and they were able to distinguish healthy from uh, six different types of cancer patients, including breast cancer and pancreatic cancer. And I think there was a 99 point or 97 percent uh, success rate. And this is a proof of concept study. So this is. Uh, fairly early on, so I think that we'll be seeing a lot more things like this. All right, one more round of applause for Amaryllis Nucleics. <laughs>